Okay, so uh, here we are again with our uh, so, um, emphasis on how to avoid getting caught in the um, gas trap, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. We're going to talk about electric vehicles and plug-in electrics today. And uh, Joe Pandek is going to be our lead talker. So unless there's any questions, we're going to let Joe take over. Joe, you're on. Thank you, George, for inviting me. Avtar, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe. Everyone just calls me Joe. And uh, it's been a uh, great experience living here in uh, this wonderful Oakmont, friendly and everything else going along with it. And I feel privileged on a day like this where we finally got the sun. We had a nice, beautiful day again. I come from uh, an area uh, that is uh, New York, mainly. It's where I was raised. And I lived for over 50 years in Los Angeles and moved up here right after the 2017 fire. Our house was OK. We had already owned two houses up here, and they were both OK. And at that time, I didn't really connect the dots about the fire, and global warming, and it, there probably is some connection to that. But basically, for the last three years, we've been really, really lucky here. And hopefully that it will not be a big issue. But the topics I'm going to discuss today are global warming and whether it's real. And the US, the EU, and the rest of the world are making some very difficult energy choices at this time. Now, we have to choose, too, whether we're going to drive a battery electric vehicle, an internal combustion engine, an ICE, a hybrid car, or a plug-in hybrid EV. So that's quite a lot of choices we have. and. I'm very uh, interested in all four of these. So I've paid a lot of attention in my life to uh, saving of energy. And that's been my basic occupation for the 60 years or so that I've been a uh, chemical engineer. Now, when you're buying a car, affordability is a very important consideration, of course. And whether you have one or multiple cars, you know, we're getting up in our years, it comes a time where whether do we still really want to drive? And the plug-in hybrid that can be charged by electricity and gasoline is a very interesting uh, development. Actually, General Motors came up with the Volt, the V-O-L-T, which they have decided about five years ago that they wouldn't continue. But I see a couple of Volts right here in Oakmont that look in really great shape. And the way the Volt was designed was a hybrid, but different than the type that we can see today. Now, I'm going to discuss the BVs, the battery electric vehicles that are available in the US, their costs and tax credit. I have tables of that. And the good thing is this presentation will be available for people to uh, see at home and go through some of the tables that I've accumulated. And we are lucky enough to have tax credits but there's a certain eligibility issues of whether your car that you chose and whether your income is within the right area, which makes it a little more different to uh, choose whether you want to be uh, or able to take advantage of the uh, tax credits. Now, I've consulted for oil refineries, nuclear power plants, geothermal power plants, solar, wind, renewable power plants for over 50 years. And I've been an early adopter of solar and hybrid cars and battery electric vehicles. I've been a real proponent of all of these uh, issues. Now, I know, and uh, after dealing with many uh, anti-pollution developments in my lifetime, that combustion of fossil fuels pollute our air with carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, NOx, sometimes natural gas, 
and SOX, SOXer, sulfur oxide, SO2s, SO3s, they all can play a role. These gases plus water vapor re-radiate solar energy, making our planet hotter than what maybe it should be. The planet has had various excursions in high temperature and low temperature over the years, ice ages that appear and then disappear over the last 100,000 years. Now, the measured CO2 in the atmosphere over Hawaii, which is where they ju ju judge how much CO2 is actually accumulating in the atmosphere, dropped during the COVID period, but it's now increasing again, which is very interesting that it happened that way. It's actually a very positive thing that it happened. Is global warming reversible is a big issue. Is, is it possible as the icebergs have melted in many areas, uh, mainly in the Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere is still a little colder than the Northern hemisphere, but there too, we're seeing the effects of global warming. And I ask, is anyone predicting the next ice age? It's not gonna be in the next 10 years, I know that, and that's about what I care about uh, for me. Most liquid fuels that are produced in petroleum refineries and gas plants. The petroleum pollution chain, which is oil production, oil transport, the refining processes, the product delivery and use of the products, each step can pollute the environment. Greta Thunberg, who's now 21, but she was 16, I believe, when she may have gotten a Nobel Prize or some big prize, has been continually arrested for the last year blocking the Swedish parliament. She has been quite a stalwart in trying to get us to switch away from uh, fossil fuels, not just in driving cars, but cement plants, uh, uh, lots of different areas, steel plants and everything else. I've been involved in consulting in most of those areas. Now, here is a really interesting development that uh, is, I think this is actually in India. It's a 2000 megawatt solar and wind farm using the same uh, distribution lines and um, transmission lines. And I haven't seen any of this here yet in the United States, but I picked it out for as I thought it was a great use of land as well as uh, existing distribution lines for transmitting the electricity. The energy choices of the US and the world, the US and its EU allies, allies are in a hot, Cold War with the Axis countries. These are Russia, China, Iran, now Yemen, North Korea, Serbia, Hungary. Hungary held up Sweden's entry into NATO, even though they're a member of NATO. And the US and Canada have become the arsenal of energy for the EU and Asian allies. We are exporting gasoline, aviation fuel, liquid natural gas, LNG, crude oil, LPG, that's liquid petroleum gases, coal, petroleum coke, and diesel fuel products. We have become the arsenal of energy in the same way that in World War II, we were the arsenal of democracy at that time. Germany, interesting enough, have shut down their nuclear power plants, which is kind of crazy, and returned to their coal-fired power plants. But today, there was a, a heartening thing that occurred they actually said they're going to start uh, building very low polluting combined cycle. They call it advanced combined cycle power plants that use natural gas. They can also be used to uh, use hydrogen as well. Now, despite the progressive position in the United States versus fossil fuels, and at times our president uh, goes along with it, it is a necessary evil to continue down our path 
but we have to lessen our use of fossil fuels. In 2023, last year, the U.S. became the biggest power developer of solar, wind, and battery energy storage power plants. And this is uh, something I accumulated last year. And what it shows is the 2023 additions of new power plants and the 56 gigawatts is equivalent to 56,000 megawatts. That's like having uh, 56 nuclear power plants being built all at once. Now this is all a net summer capacity. So the solar is huge. It's more than 50% of the total. But also batteries are 17%. Wind is 13%, and a new nuclear power plant went uh, came up in Georgia for uh, Georgia Power. And natural gas, these would be clean natural gas fired power plants, are 14% uh, of the total. And what we took in retirements, got rid of these power plants. Coal notice, we got rid of 62% of our coal fired power plants. And Natural gas, these would be just com uh, not advanced combined cycle plants, but they would be plants that are just peakers we've gotten rid of. And these uh, in here represent the, um, um, I'm sorry. These represent the petroleum. And on the next slide, I actually show what happened in uh, electricity um, generation in 2023 and percentage of share of each type. This brown line starting in 2002, 2001 to the current 2023 the use of coal producing electricity went down from 50%, and that was been over 50% for many, many years, it went precipitously down over the last 20 years to where now it represents just over 15% of our, our power usage. While natural gas uh, using advanced combined cycle power plants, which are very clean, very low NOx produ production, uh, is now up to over 43%. That's the blue line. The red line are solar and wind, which was less than 7 or 8% back in 2002, now represents 23% of the total electricity that's being generated in the United States. This is a great development, and I'm very happy about that. The green line is nuclear. Now, nuclear was around 20%. We have about 100 uh, nuclear power plants in the United States. And one or two have gone offline, including the one in California, owned by Southern California Edison, the San Onofre plant. They were able to get offline. The, their, the utilities are not in love with their nuclear power plants. Each one, each 1,000 megawatt power plants that typically 1,000 or 1,200 megawatts, they have 1,000 uh, people employed at each plant. So Edison was able to get rid of 2,000 of their employees by getting rid of those two plants. Maybe you have a couple, uh, a couple of ships left just to watch the uh, uh, nuclear rods that are still at each plant. But basically... Uh, nuclear is being talked about as being the next area of emission-free power plant. Now, the Sierra Club, for many, many years, fought nuclear, but now it's being considered, again, emission-less type plant, even though it uh, does have uh, you know, issues regarding the uh, uh, nuclear rods that get spent nuclear rods. But this is a great development, and uh, this helps us uh, in terms of uh, lowering the potential of global warming. Now, the politics 
and and the oil pet petroleum oil pollution chain are a real big issue. The search and discovery of petroleum crude oil has caused wars and pollution for the last 50 years or longer. Oil was discovered in the 1850s. The first refineries were built around that time. They were very simple refineries. At that time, we didn't have internal combustion engines. But over time, oil has become more and more of an issue for affecting foreign policy. After World War I, the Kurds were promised a country. And in 1923, they were unpromised a country after oil was found in the Kurdish area in Iraq. The Kurds were, are now dispersed in Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iran, resulting in new wars over those issues. And of course, there's a lot going on in that area because of that. So the Turks are at war with the Kurds. Iraq has a, a thing going on. Iran is in, at war with the Kurds. And our troops are in the Kurdish area of Iraq. We're protecting them and using that as a basis to go after ISIS. Probably George Bush made a big mistake attacking Iraq at that time in uh, 19, um, in 2001 or so. Yes, I'm gonna go faster, but George, I, there's a reason for I'm doing this, okay? Mideast oil has caused much turmoil for the West. Oil embargoes by OPEC twice, Transportation of oil in ships and pipelines caused numerous oil spills. The huge Arco oil spill, now British Petroleum, near Santa Barbara in the 1960s, was tragic. It was the beginning of the big ones, oil spills. The grounding of the Exxon Valdez in Prince William Sound, Alaska, caused a large spill, uh, spill there, too. The BP deep well explosion in the Gulf of Mexico caused the worst oil spill ever. Petroleum refineries typically are polluters. This is where most of the fuel gasoline is made. This happens to be Benicia. Uh, uh, excuse me, Martinez. I worked on part of this refinery and Benicia refinery as well. These are a mixture of steam and hydrocarbons going up into the atmosphere. I went by there two weeks ago and it was spewing this dirt right into our atmosphere then too. This is the oil spill in Vancouver, English Bay, from the MV Marathasa oil. And all of this, and we still have uh, good things happening among our hybrids and battery electric vehicles. In 2004, we got our first Prius hybrid. After 250,000 miles, we sold it last year. And we sold it with EGR issues, which is the uh, emission uh, gas recirculation valve, which is a costly item to fix. For me, it was too small and slow, but it was all right for my sister. She loved it. 2005, we found a Highlander hybrid, which is one of the earlier, larger hybrids. It now has 145,000 miles, still gets 26 miles per gallon, and still a great SUV. In 2009, we stepped up to a Lexus RX 450 hybrid, now owned by my daughter in Connecticut, with 147,000 miles, 28 miles per gallon, and was a great SUV. In 2010 is when I finally got wise, installed solar photovoltaic, solar hot water systems to our home and lowered costs by $3,500 a year. This is what we're trying to do in Oakmont. One of the things that we're still getting huge bills, those of us who have solar are not getting huge electric bills, but we're getting natural gas bills that are out of this world. And that's an next area I didn't talk to George about yet, but there are things we can do about that. In 2010, I leased an early Nissan Leaf. I, it was delivered 14 months. I was one of the, the first day that you could order it. I ordered it. 
It had a range of only 90 miles, but it was a great car. And my on Tim right over here still has a leaf and he's still using it, but he had the same issues I have, the small range. He's going to be talking about it later. Due to the early adoption of the leaf, I received a free 220 volt EV charger, just $2,000 thing, they just gave it to me. Uh, the Leaf was comfortable, performed well, with no operating or maintenance cost. The only issue was tires. They were kind of thin tires, and if you hit the curb hard, they would go. They would, But that's something that I think they fixed up a bit. Three years of running that Leaf was great. The Fiat 500E was the next one I had. No maintenance, better performance and pickup, two recalls, but it's been, it was a good car. Again, low range. Now, in 2018, after test driving the Tesla Model 3 sedan, I ordered the 2020 Tesla Y. It took about 14 months to deliver that one as well. And the Tesla Y battery electric vehicle that I received in July of 2020 was the best car I've ever had. Colleen liked, my, my wife, Colleen, loved that car so much that she ordered a Tesla X. And that's, she loves that car. She does 15,000 miles a year on that car. Sold the original Y to Honda for $40,000 and purchased a new 2023 Y last year and took advantage of the tax credit of $7,500. Now, as a result of this personal journey, journey I went through, I came to the conclusion we don't need ICE cars, internal combustion engine cars. We can just get along without it. It's not going to happen. We're going to have these cars for a long time. The Tesla Model 3 had a 300 plus range. It was the perfect sedan. And uh, I have a couple of friends who are here who have the three. I ordered the Tesla Y SUV without driving it. And it wasn't, I wasn't the only one because it is the most popular model in the United States and said in the world right now. It became clear that battery electric vehicles are a better route for personal transportation. Gasoline and other fuels are about 70% of the products from an oil refinery. Diesel fuels are likely an unnecessary transportation fuel especially with the German cheating on the emission devices that they install. That was a real amazing thing. And Volkswagen had to pay a $20 billion uh, fine, but they didn't actually pay the money. They're supposedly putting in chargers to equal to that $20 billion. Tesla and Cummins have EV semi-trucks operating. EVs are better than diesel trucks. The torque for a DC electric motor is infinite at zero velocity. That's why they're used for elevators. Aviation fuels were still required, but substitutes are being developed. And I know some of the people doing it. The refineries and the oil pollution chain can now gradually be phased out. It won't happen quickly, though. Here's my test of why uh, in red. And uh, it's just an amazing car. Now, battery electric vehicles have no exhaust and are simpler than uh, the other hybrids, the electric hybrids. BVs should be charged at home using solar electricity. And the biggest advantage for me is no trips to the gas station. That is the biggest advantage. As you get older, why go to a gas station? Electricity produced by home solar fuel my two BVs air conditioning, water pumps, two fridges, et cetera. The solar electricity cost is low. It's eight cents a kilowatt hour amortized over the 25 years over the cost of my solar uh, installation. And this is only true due to the net energy metering rules that we have in place in California that the electric companies were trying to get rid of. Now, the drive is superior to an internal combustion engine due to the inherent torque advantages of an electric motor. The battery lowers the center of gravity, improving handling on curves. Tesla acceleration is very quick, especially with one pedal driving. 
Now the BEVs have minimal maintenance issues and more, since it's still a relatively new area, electric motors last 500,000 miles or more. The only things I need on maintenance are wipers, wiper fluid, tire rotations, and tires every 20, 25,000. I still haven't gotten to my first round of tires. Lithium-based batteries have been proven in millions of BEVs. So that's one issue that we have to deal with still uh, is the battery. The battery requires temperature control system. At zero degrees Fahrenheit, as exper people experienced this past winter, then it may be problematic. Now, I was up in, in uh, Yosemite with my um, electric car, and we got down to just 30 degrees, maybe in 28 degrees, and was outside. We had no trouble starting up the next day, whatever, or even charging. But there have been lots of people who are in Chicago and whatever who I guess can get below freezing, below zero degree. Now, I also have discovered that the 12-volt battery that every car has, both regular cars, ICE cars, but also battery electric cars have, can be a problem, software issues. The Kia, the Cadillac Lyric BEV has some issues, but not Tesla. At 22,000 miles in three years, our battery is still functioning very well. Now, comparison of hybrids, uh, plug-in hybrid electric cars and Tesla BEVs. Typically, hybrids, PHVs, and ICE vehicles require the following. A dealer to test drive, haggle the price, purchase, and perform maintenance. Need gasoline stations, waiting in line, Costco. $6 gasoline really causes the lines to grow. Gas engines, starters, starting battery, spark plugs, fuel injection systems, all need maintenance at various times. Hybrids also need electric motor and battery to operate, but that's the least important issue. They, they operate for a long time. Plug-in hybrid EVs, Tim on my right is going to be talking about it, need a charging port, larger charging battery, and charger control system. Now, regular engine maintenance, oil changes, brakes, tune-ups, air, and cabin filters are still needed on hybrid cars. Transmissions with multiple forward gears needing transmission oil and coolers are part of the deal. Radiators with glycol water coolant, servicing, gasoline tanks, gas filters. Exhaust system with the EGR valve. That's the emission um, gas recirculation valve. Mufflers and catalytic converters, and that become a target for thieves. It requires smog testing every few years, and take with, that take time and cost. Now, this is a RAV4. I also have seen, this is early in the morning, and what you're seeing here is vapor and gas coming out of the mufflers of this car. But I've seen it actually in a Prius Prime last Wednesday morning when I went to the doctor at a quarter to eight. So you still have pollution with even Priuses and uh, other cars. But listen, there's a lot of advantages to a Prius that 50 miles per gallon, it's a one. And, and when you get it with the uh, plug-in version of it, I think you get as much as 65 to 70 miles per gallon. It's not kind of unlimited. Now, we have serious problem with our air. This is before pictures in Milan, Italy, three months after the COVID lockdown and before. This is the clean air. We don't think of Milan as being, but I, as being terrible air. But I, I times I've been there, I, I realize it had. But LA has got the same thing, and I got to show pictures of LA before and after too. But LA has done a lot in cleaning up its air over the last uh, twenty years. Now, this is a table a calculation. If you want to put in solar to run your uh, fuel for your electric cars, plug-in or uh, regular electric cars. 
BEVs. So typically, a solar PV system produces 1,300 kilowatt hours per kilowatt. And that happens to be installed in 2023 on my, this is actual measurements of my, at my house. And I have not the best uh, exposure to the sun uh, because we're in the, the, in the uh, shadow of Annadale. So this will be available to you, but that's the big number. 1,300 kilowatts per kilowatt will give you that many kilowatt hours. Now, how do you figure out how many um, kilowatts one needs this calculation shows, and uh, I'll go into that a little bit later. But basically, my wife's X is less efficient than mine. She gets 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour. And so she drives 15,000 miles, divide that by the efficiency, it's 4,286. You can get these numbers from the EPA, but these are actual driving numbers from my wife. My Tesla Y is more efficient, 4.1. It's equivalent to 135 miles per gallon. And uh, I'd only drive 5,000 miles because she likes to do all the driving. So uh, between the two, we, we use about 5,500 uh, kilowatt hours uh, to produce the fuel for our two cars. Now, the beauty of that, of course, is we don't pay for gasoline. And we have a large enough solar installation. We're about nine and a half kilowatts. And I have upped it uh, to account for that. By calculating this, I found out how much I need. It's a, I need, if I had a 400 watts um, per panel, 11 panels would cover the need for the annual use of the um, fuel for my two cars. Oh, it's going the wrong direction. Sorry. Now, internal combustion engines, vehicles, hybrids are generally better than standard internal combustion engine cars because they use less fuel per mile and have longer range and longer lifetime. You see the difference on trucks. It's just a great deal. And the savings... Uh, are tremendous. You look at a Prius getting over 50 miles per gallon over a car that maybe gets 30 miles per gallon, an efficient car. That's not a, uh, a hybrid. The long-term effects of that is great. Now, the lower fuel consumption produces less exhaust pollution and uh, than a standard internal combustion engine. But hybrids, PHV, still require gasoline which leads to the oil pollution chain. The oil business is profitable for investors and workers, but I have a feeling it's going to last for 50 plus years more. And it's hopeful global warming is reversible. And the sooner we wean ourselves from fossil fuels in transportation, the better off it is. I just looked it up before I came here. We, in the United States, 30% of our uh, emissions of CO2 come from transportation. In California, ICE vehicles may be sold only to 2035. Gavin Newsom thinks this is a great law, but I have a feeling that he'll be out of office and that law will likely be changed. And uh, I think it's very unfair because they're, it's really an affordability issue for many people. We got probably 50 million cars with 40 million drivers. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing how, uh, how much cars we have in California. But, of course, purchasing of used vehicles has not been outlawed. And so that would probably be a loophole, even if the law didn't stay the same. Now, why buy a hybrid over a battery electric vehicle? Well, it's obvious. Apartment dwellers may not have access to BEV charging. And that's a very large percentage of the population. Affordability and hybrids can produce excellent range, up to two, up to 500 miles. Some uh, some BEVs like a Lucid can get up to 500 miles as well, but uh, they can be quite expensive compared to uh, most cars. Hybrids appear to last longer than standard 
ICE cars, in my experience, twice as long. I gave you the example of my old Highlander and my old Lexus that are still plodding along beautifully for my uh, uh, daughter and my granddaughter. Now, if this is my thanks to my walking partner, Bill, if one travels to inaccessible locations, VEV charters may not be available. So you basically, you know, your mission profile needs, you need a uh, gasoline car. The ability to carry gasoline in a transportable container is also a, a good thing to have. Make sure you have a car large enough. Now, due to the IRA tax credit, investment costs are investment costs are now about the same between hybrids and EVs. EV prices have come way down. And I'll explain that later too. Now, the main vehicle costs are depreciation, insurance, fuel, and maintenance. Depreciation and insurance, the fixed costs, overwhelm any cost for fuel and maintenance costs. If you want to save money, don't you don't need to buy a solar, a, a BEV car at all. I think in many cases, the hybrid will be just the same. Toyota has done a great job on hybrids. And it all depends on how you feel about the environment as well. You know, I, I've, I'm a late believer in uh, the environment, but I have uh, a mea culpa. I'm one of the people that caused a lot of the issues by working for the refineries for those 50 plus years. Now, this is uh, the typical cost. I, I can blow it up. Oh, you can't see that, but I'll, I can blow it up. But basically, uh, I can read to you that I, my BEV, electricity uh, cost and the cost per mile is two cents per mile. And you could get a very efficient hybrid that can actually be in the same range. George, you calculated one and a half cents? Yeah. For, that's you have the hybrid plug-in, the Prius plug-in, right? So that's very, you know, it's very possible. So I'm saying don't buy an electric car to save money. It's all a function of environmental and convenience. For me, I'm saving money in that I don't have to go to gas stations. I, mean, I laugh at $6 gasoline. And uh, I, I go to Costco anyway because I like going there. But I don't have to stay in line anymore for the uh, gasoline. Now, the new rules for the uh, EV tax credit of $7,500 are very interesting. It's starting January 1st, a few months ago. The new rules established, new rules were established to obtain the $7,500 tax credit. But they weren't f quite finished on January 1st. They've changed the rules. But about every week, there's a new item coming up. The EV price limits for sedans stayed the same. The sedan has to be under $55,000. And the Model 3 is way under that. And so the Model 3 uh, should be able to get it depending on the uh, where the battery came from. Now, SUVs or trucks, the price has to be less than $80,000 to fit into getting this tax credit. But dealers may give the tax credit directly to you as a to get you to buy their car. So you may get it directly or it may be officially a tax credit by filing with your uh, uh, your return, your tax return. Now, the, the problem is the buyer adjusted gross income, the AGI, you have to be less than $150,000 your AGI if you're single or $300,000 you're married. And most people fit into that who live here in Oakmont. There are some people that may make more money than that. Now, the highlight to this rules is called the Foreign Entities of Concern, the FEOC. The new access countries that I highlighted earlier, uh, Russia uh, and, and so on, and China and on the list, they're out. There's no way they can get the test credit unless they build it in Mexico. 
And BYD has worked out a deal with Obrador, the, the president of Mexico, to potentially build a BYD plant and Jalisco, Jalisco, J-A-L-I-S-C-O. And that, with the agreement we have with uh, Mexico, uh, they might be able to bring that car in to this country. But this is all, you know, a lot of rules and whatever. Anyway, uh, EVs with components from the FEOC countries don't get any credit. So they might only get half the credit if it works out. Now, EVs that have 50% of the material sourced from North America or eligible countries, and Japan and Korea are in there, South Korea, are eligible for the rebate at $37.50. But there is one material, which you can't really believe, that still we can't get, and that's graphite. China controls the graphite market. And it's an ultra pure form of graphite. It seems to me that we could be doing that right here in this country. Now, obtaining the full credit for this, uh, for your batteries, 50% of the comp components has to come from USMCA, that's Canada and Mexico, or those with a free trade agreement with the US, Japan, South Korea. So these are complex rules, but in the end, the only way you'll really know is you go to your dealer that you're dealing with. And with Tesla, you don't have really have a dealer. You can go there, but you just do everything online when you buy a car. Now, the table of new US-made BEVs in March of 24. So that we're in the same month. So Tesla has four cars, uh, vehicles, the three, the Y, the S, and the X. And it's possible to get the tax credit with the three, probably half. The Y, you'd get the full 7,500. The Lux sedan, what's called the S, you wouldn't be able to. And because uh, it's $70,000 price. Or, but the X is an SUV, and you can get a full $7,500 tax credit. And the price of that has gone down to $79,000. So it's, I can't say that it's uh, afford affordable, but if you have a little money and just last, in my case, uh, we justified buying the X because it's our last car. You know, we don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, I love that the Ford Mach-E sedan, it's all-wheel drive. My friend Gabriel owns one, loves it, except he has had problems with charging the vehicle on the road. It's only about a $49,000 car now, and it would probably get thirty-seven fifty dollars of the tax credit because of the battery issue. But go to the dealer, and it's all negotiable. The Ford dealers are trying to get rid of them because people are stopped buying EVs. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's what's happened. Now, the Ford Lightning is the F-150 Lariat pickup. It was a great car, $75,000. Get a full $7,500 tax credit. And again, it sold like crazy the first year it was out. And last year, they couldn't give them away. People weren't interested in them. So it's a shame. But people who would buy pickups don't necessarily want electric cars. Now, the Bolt EUV that our friend Peter has, um, and I think Marilyn has too, um, she's a member of the Future Club, Marilyn Parr, uh, it can get the full task credit, and uh, but there's been issues with that car, which we can uh, get into later, maintenance issues. Chevy, uh, Silverado pickup, uh, should be able to get it, but the Hummer pickup, which is a hundred and five thousand dollar car, not. And uh, it's a huge car, but the dealer price is very negotiable because then, the, actually, the Hummer is selling really well because uh, there's, I guess, a uh, uh, certain group of people that really like it. Now the Rivians are great cars. They're brand new companies, just like Tesla was, but they've only been operating for the last few years. And they have a pickup, RIT, and a SUV. And both nice looking cars. 
We see a couple of those around here in Oakmont. And my son really likes the R1S, uh, the SUV. And, uh, but there's some, there's some maintenance issues with those two. The Lucid Air Pure sedan is, is problematic, um, meaning that I don't think they're selling any, any more of them. The Touring sedan is 86000 Both the Lucids would not get the tax credit at the present time. But again, dealers, price may be negotiable. Um, but it's, it's really uh, it's a shame that it's so complex. You don't really know if you get a tax credit or not. But the good thing is if you go to the dealer, at least you can test drive it and see if it's a car you want to drive. And you can work out what the price is going to be. Yes. And I'm just going to go into foreign manufacturing of, of BEVs. And uh, what time? Oh, we're at, I've been talking for 45 minutes already. All right. Now, I, I think I can stop it, but the foreign manufacturing of BEVs is critical. China is leading the world with over 20,000 companies designing, manufacturing BEVs, including Tesla in Shanghai. The only one of those companies that are profitable right now is Tesla. BYD, even though they say they're, they're uh, competitive with Tesla, are not. I have a, a film that can talk about that. It's a seven-minute film that I can show you later if you'd like to stay for it. China has the capacity to make 20 million BEVs annually, but currently selling 6 million to the populace. They're in a recession in China right now. And uh, they have very rich people, and they have regular people now. And when I visited China, it was almost all poor people. OK. Um, one thing, China firms manufacture many European vehicles, including Volvo, Volkswagen, Polestar. And so they're all made in China. Tesla has a major manufacturing in Berlin. Germany's Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, BMW, and Mercedes make many models, and they're talking about making them in the United States too. Stellantis is a major, is a merger of Fiat, Chrysler, and French PSA Group, and have some BEVs for sale in Europe, but not here yet. Here's this long table of all the European. The most promising one is the Honda, and the Honda Prologue has just gotten the $7,500 tax credit. And I would look at that car. It's a beautiful-looking car. There's an issue with range. I think it's only a 250-mile range. Toyota also has a joint development with Subaru. Subaru. It's the Solterra and the B. Z4X, and they both have low range, 210 mile range, but they're nice cars. And uh, one may want to look at them, just go to the dealer. They're probably selling them for cheap right now. Now, I'm not going to go into why Tesla is a leading manufacturer of BEVs. You don't need to know that. I've been talked about it separately. Here's the best 10 vehicles that Consumer Reports uh, have made uh, after polling their people. Uh, this was the March 24 Consumer Reports. The EV Tesla Y dominated U.S. sales, replacing the Model 3 that topped the list uh, uh, last year. So the EV is a Tesla Y. But Toyota has four of the best vehicles made, all hybrids, and as you notice, I have a Toyota Highlander and a, a Lexus, which, is, of course, is also made by, by Toyota. The midsize sedan Camry hybrid, the Prius hybrid and plug-in PHEV, the PHEV SUV RAV4 Prime, and the midsize SUV Highlander hybrid. It's funny that they call that a midsize because that's a pretty large hybrid. Now, Rivian had the highest owner satisfaction with 86% pleased, but they have, they've got some issues with the car. Small car is just a regular Mazda 3, and it's not a hybrid. The subcontact SUV Subaru Crosstrek, which I think may be available in a hybrid. I'm not 100% sure about that. 
The compact SUV is a Subaru Forester. The luxury SUV is the BMW X5 X6 combination, X6, which is a PHV plug-in hybrid. The small pickup is a Ford Maverick. So you have a lot to choose from in uh, luxury type cars. Now, the Pu People's Republic of China subsidized EV production for the 20 plus Chinese manufacturers. They have vowed to try to put Tesla out of business. And they're keeping Tesla there. They stole a lot of Tesla's work in their cars, but Tesla uh, still feels that they can produce some cars and bring them in here. The Wall Street Journal of March 4th, China car makers develop new models more quickly than the US or EU countries. BYD is the foremost Chinese manufacturer promote, and was promoted by Warren Buffett of uh, Berkshire, unfortunately. I, I, he's trying to sell his, his stock at this point. But BYD is a very organized, well-run company. But there was an article in today's paper that they're losing money on their plants in, uh, in Europe and other places. The following is a seven-minute film discussing Chinese EV manufacturing process progress. You'll be shocked, but I'm not going to do it right now because we got other things to do. My conclusions: Vehicles are tools that carry people and goods and must fit buyer's mission profile. We live in a, fr a free society and generally can choose whatever vehicles we wish. Affordability is very important, and the tax credit lowers the cost of most. VVs and hybrids. Tesla supercharger network makes travel convenient to most places in the U.S. The Tesla supercharger network is increasing and generally well maintained. The cost to charge at a Tesla supercharger is 40 cents a kilowatt hour, which is very fair. It's actually lower than the PGE peak pricing. At home, for me, it's just 8 cents a kilowatt hour using my solar. Used EVs can obtain a $4,000 tax credit. So the Nissan Leafs, which you might be able to get at the dealer, or the Fiats, which are great cars, but low range, could be probably bought for under $10,000. And I think they're great. But it's necessary to purchase them from dealers. Or maybe it's private, but you wouldn't get the tax credit. Hybrid and PHEV plug-in EV vehicles are very popular, and they allow long ranges. That's one of the best advantages of them. In our audience are a number of owners of BEVs and ready for the Q&A. Tim, do you want to go ahead and talk about yours? Well, we've covered quite a bit there. So, If I went a little long, it's because this topic is a big topic and it costs a lot of money, but... Um, so, um, are you on? I think so. Okay, good. Good. Um, I, you know, I know we're pressed for time, so I'll just kind of cut to some of the most important pieces. Um, you know, one of the, the Joe spent a good deal of time laying the groundwork about why, uh, get one of these vehicles. And that was what brought me into it. Uh, I have both a, uh, a plug-in hybrid and a straight electric vehicle. We have a 2014 plug-in uh, hybrid uh, Prius, and I have a 2020 Nissan Leaf. Prior to the Leaf, I also had a hybrid. Uh, I had a Prius, but it was not a plug-in. And, um, you know, when I look at what's important to me, I have grandchildren out there, and the world that they're going to inherit is... Uh, very challenging and getting worse. And as Joe pointed out, it's a lot of it's because of the the um, climate that we're creating with all the pollution that we're spewing. So, uh, so that was my primary motivation in getting an electric vehicle. It wasn't enough for me to drive a Prius. And uh, getting that Nissan Leaf was one of the best decisions I ever made. I love that car. It's quieter than the than the uh, Prius, and the Prius is a good car. I love that when I drove it too, but. The, uh, the Nissan Leaf is quieter, it's more comfortable, so it's world's faster. Uh, and then, the, you know, the other 
benefit that I've realized, and I really didn't do a whole lot of research on this piece, is the cost. So I just did a little quick analysis, uh, and since we budget by the month, I'd, and I haven't tracked our mileage, I can't tell you how many kilowatt hours per mile we spend, but I can tell you how our budget works. Um, this is for, the, uh, for my wife's plug-in uh, hybrid. The fuel cost is $53 a month. That's what she spends on gas. My cost, which is I calculated what, what the difference is in our solar production now versus what the drag on it is since I got my niece on leaf um, and calculated the difference. I'm paying $7 a month to fuel my Nissan Leaf. Uh, maintenance cost on the Prius has averaged over the last two years, $91 a month. My Nissan Leaf, $4 a month. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the point that you really want to look at is, you know, what are your goals? If you want to go green and you feel strongly about the environment, uh, either one of those type of vehicles would be a good choice. Um, if you uh, really like the idea of complete transformation and total cost of ownership, then, uh, then look at a, an electric vehicle. And with the kind of ranges they're getting today, now my, my LEAF gets about 150 miles. That's, that's the stated mileage. But if I use the air conditioner or the heater, that cuts it down by at least a third, maybe more. Then I'm a little bit of a cowboy with the accelerator pedal. Um, and so that cuts it down even further. So when my battery is fully charged and it says I have 150 miles, it's probable that I'm only going to get 75 miles out of it. So uh, there are not a whole lot of places I want to go outside of Sonoma County and, and rely on that charge. So, uh, so we keep the, uh, the, you know, my wife's Prius for our longer trips. If we're going to go into the city. Um, you know, if we're going to drive to Portland or whatever it is, we'll use the, the, the hybrid. And for all the around town driving, it's always the Nissan Leaf. So it's a, it's a perfect car for around this area. Uh, as Joe showed, there are a lot of hybrids, I mean, a lot of um, uh, EVs coming out now with ranges easily up into the 300 and even 400 mile range. If you've got the money and you want to invest in one of those, that's, it really should take away any concerns about range because if, even if you couldn't make it for the full, say five, 600 miles that you might want to drive if you're going from one end of the state to the other, uh, you can stop and have dinner and, uh, you know, in a period of about an hour with a fast charger now, you're going to get another couple hundred miles. So I, I think range is getting to the point where it's just not much of a consideration, at least with the newer EVs. Uh, in my case, with an older EV, uh, older, it's only a, you know, it's a three-year-old car, a uh, four-year-old car, but, uh, you know, the range is substantially less. Um, I never buy new cars because I don't think there's a lot of value uh, or there is a lot of value that you lose just as you drive it off the lot. So if you're thinking about getting an EV and you haven't taken the plunge yet, my advice would be find yourself a two or three year old uh, EV as a used car and you, you're probably going to get a much better uh, buy on it and uh, it'll give you a chance to sort of break it in. As Joe pointed out, uh, if you're going to do that, you really want to have solar on the house because it it is going to drive your electric bill up if you don't have solar. Um, that's probably about the gist of my comments. Do we want to throw it open for questions, George? Or... I want to make a couple of comments first. Um, I think what you've heard here is a little bit of proselytizing from those who have this particular faith. And I think that it's safe to say I'm another one of them. Uh, but we're also dealing with true economics. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. There we go. So you think about a plug-in. It's really fairly simple to plug in your vehicle. This is a Prius Prime, a modern one. I have an old one. Um, Joe was showing you some of the numbers. Uh, this was from a green cars listing. Uh, the plug-ins are right in there with the electrics, okay? A plug-in, think about it as having a small uh, distance you can go. But how much more, how many days a week do you go more than 30 miles, okay? 
It would be very rare for us to do that more than one day a week. Any other time we're taking the car out, where are we going? We're over to Oliver's, maybe downtown. Okay, so we use our uh, 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 plug-in, and I would say that we hardly ever use gas. We're always using a uh, battery. Uh, however, if we get down as far as Petaluma, you know, we're going to use a little bit of gas. And if we decide, well, heck with it, we want to take it into San Francisco, don't have to find a place to plug it in, we're going to use gas. But it's a hybrid glass gas. So therefore, it's a very efficient uh, internal combustion engine. I would say we normally are now getting around 200 miles to the gallon for the for the combination. Okay. Um, and we charge ours overnight using a 110 outlet. Uh, very easy to do. Okay. Now, obviously, you're using um, electricity. This is where you've heard, again, a couple of uh, uh, people up here who believe in this saying this is the reason you need solar. And by the way, it just it makes more sense to do solar today, even if you don't have the old rate structure. The other thing is uh, there are a number of people who have plugins who sort of forget to use the plug-in part and drive it, okay? So it really means you got to say, every night I'm going to plug this sucker in. Okay, uh, I'm going to go real quickly. Um, let's just skip to the next table. Okay, Whoop, there you go. Um, I'm using here 15 cents a kilowatt for the solar. Okay, the reason is because although Joe gets 8 cents, he's on the old system. If you got new solar, it'll be 15 cents a kilowatt. So take a look. Gas, 12 and a half cents. Hybrid, 10. Electric vehicle, 6. Un plug in 4 if you're not using gas. More like the hybrid if you are using gas. And you can see with solar that that gets to be even substantially less. Okay, um, tax credits. Um, for almost all electrics, you're gonna get a $1,000 check from PG&E, new or used. Okay, you have the tax credit Joe's talked about. Um, some dealers say that if you cannot get use the tax credit personally, that they can arrange a lease that will include it. Um, don't trust them unless they're people who you really do trust because they're just trying to sell you a car. Okay, reducing your footprint, saving money. Now we'll go to Q&A. Uh, Can I call uh, someone I brought? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Tim, you've got the uh, portable mic. Sure. Could you uh, take it over to whoever? Yeah, and, and as I'm walking it over, uh, one thing I did want to point out is that the, uh, at least my leaf has a timer where you can decide what time you want that to start charging and you can set it to go on at midnight or whatever because remember the rate structure changes after 9 p.m. the rates drop so you don't want to charge your your vehicle while you're still paying the higher rates both of you uh, the presenters have mentioned the leaf as a good choice i read about a the end of last week that there was a plan by Nissan to close their manufacturing in the U.S., which would mean it might very soon be difficult to get a new uh, Nissan Leaf. Uh, do you know, is that true or false? Uh, they are continuing in Europe, I understand, to continue to produce with no plans to stop. Yeah, I can respond to that. Uh, the Nissan Leaf has been discontinued. Uh, and it's uh, been replaced by a new vehicle called the Ar Aria or Aria. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful looking vehicle. I don't know a lot about it. Consumer Reports rates it uh, as, a, as a good buy. I don't think it's rated as their best, but that's what Nissan has replaced the uh, Leaf with. I should also comment, remember the comment about used cars. Okay, I can... Joe has made the point that many of these vehicles 
have a long life, okay? Longer than a traditional internal combustion engine. Thinking about that, buying a used car from a reliable dealer, okay, is a very good choice. Uh, by the way, I have a, a question coming up on the uh, Zoom participants, so I'll go over to that in a minute. Hi. Um, I did have one question. By the way, I'm a believer, too. I have a plug-in hybrid, and I also have solar panels, and it works exactly the way these guys described it in terms of costs and things, and I almost never put gas in it. Uh, so my question is about solid state batteries. We're hearing a lot, reading a lot, I am anyway, about that. And Toyota seems to be on the front end of that. Um, can you tell us anything about that? I can comment on that. Um, Toyota is uh, a lot of talk. And they're trying to stay alive in and not be ashamed of what they've done for the last five, six years. And they don't have a solid state battery at this point. They're talking about it. And uh, there are a lots of talk about solid state, but the tr issue is m making them inexpensive enough and on an assembly line basis and have many years of use of it. And so far, the company that's the best uh, manufacturer of batteries in the world is not Tesla. It's CATL. It's from China. And they're potentially putting up a factory in the United States working with Tesla and also potentially working with another company. They're more likely to come up with a solid state. But it's not, I don't even think that is an issue because I go long range with my Tesla. You know, we'll go uh, to LA, to Oregon, to uh, Yosemite, as I mentioned. And you stop, go to the bathroom, you know, have a cup of coffee, you charge it up. The whole purpose of solid state batteries is to do it faster. You know, that's all. And I don't see much of a use for it. And look at George, he's happy just at 110 voltage. You know, the what's called a supercharger that's charging at 250 um, uh, kilowatt, 250 kilowatts of, of power. And there's, that's the V3 supercharger. The V4 supercharger is at 350. Now, that would speed up quite a bit by coming from that to that. But because of the confusion over battery connectors, something has happened in the, just in the past year the Tesla charging system, called the NACS, North American Charging System, has now become uniform for all cars that are being built after 2025. Ford has got it available right now for their EVs. So that's very, very important is the charging and on longer trips. I mean, I like you, George, I don't go that far myself, but I do go two hours away. I go to the coast and you know travel up that, that far. And I have a charger at, at our other house as well, so I'm not worried about it. But I was until I got the charger at the other place. The um, I, I have very fond memories of my Nissan Leaf, which had the 90 mile range. Tim has the long range version, and I would have to go up a hill to my house, a seven mile drive from PCH up to the top of Topanga in LA. And I'd get to my site and I'd be getting these red marks up. You're getting close, you're zero. You're at zero miles, but I'm still driving. And I just make it to the charger because I had a charger at home too. I, as I mentioned, I got one for free. So it's like, it's almost a game, but the, the Leaf was always such a good pal. It always never failed me in that whole time. But I only got it on a lease, and you know, long term, I didn't want to have the heartache of dealing with it. By the way, is Gary here? Gary? Oh, okay. Okay, I've got two questions online I'd like to cover reasonably quickly. Um, the first one has to do with the question about lithium. 
we will often hear about the problem of not having any domestic production of lithium and being in a situation where the lithium is predominantly controlled by China. Okay. While that is to some extent technically true, okay, it's not like it's a panic. Lithium is available in many different formats worldwide. The major problem for the U.S. is, as with many mined products, or lithium can also be uh, developed out of salt water, like at the Salton Sea, there are not in my backyard problems with, yes, we need that, but don't do it on my reservation or don't do it here. So, uh, but lithium, uh, we'll talk about it a lot. It will be at times a little bit of an issue. Don't lose sleep over it. The other question that came up, and one of you might have a comment on this, uh, okay, is um, are we going to see two-way charging? Meaning the ability to use your battery to power your house in an outage. Okay, so uh, any comments on that, Joe? Tim? Yeah, uh, Tim, do you want to take that? Uh, just that I know that already exists. I believe some Teslas are set up to do that. Yeah, there's uh, that type of a charging system. It. George and I both have batteries, and the reason we have batteries. For me, it was my wife. She didn't want to have to go through the refrigerator. You know, we got the PSPS thing going on here all the time. So we get the shutdowns. And no, Colleen didn't like going through the freezer and see what was good and what was bad and throw things out. So we wound up getting the, um, the battery backup for our house. But so I don't particularly need it. But the Ford Lightning is supposedly have the two-way charging. And I think the General, Mo the General Motors um, Silverado is supposed to have two-way charging, too. But it, these are just talks. I don't think anybody really has it installed yet. And uh, it may be more a Midwest thing or whatever, but it doesn't, I don't see any of that going on here right now. Well, having said that, though, Joe, I think it's safe to say we will see two-way charging as a norm sometime in the next few years. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard not to see that as a valuable thing. Right. Okay, we had a question over here. Yeah, so um, actually my heart is sinking a little bit because um, I do not have solar and I have a 17-year-old roof and so um, installing solar would most likely require me putting in a new roof and I don't think that's going to meet my budget. Um, but I'm very much interested in getting a plug-in hybrid, uh, a used one. And I, my question is, um, you, you talked about the catastrophic, um, you know, bills that people were getting, um, and you mentioned natural gas. So question number one is I don't understand. Is that a PG&E thing? Well, you're heating your home. Typically, um, you're using natural gas to do the heat in our homes here at Oakmont. Okay. Unless you have a wood fireplace where you're not allowed to use it, but you might have wood fireplace. I, I think that would be a great solution for all of us because anyway, we can't use it. So I let me go back because I want to make sure I get my actual question is, if I were to get a plug-in hybrid... Is there any way I can um, get an estimate of what that's going to raise my PG&E bill? <laughs> uh, because what you all are saying is don't even consider it unless you have solar panels. I don't think that's quite the way to look at it. It's, but it is complicated enough that uh, trying to deal with it as a non-techie okay, can be difficult. First of all, there is an alternative to a gas furnace, which is a heat pump, okay? And we're all waiting right now for the Inflation Recovery Act to finish its process of setting up rebates. We're reaching a point where it may be possible, particularly for smaller Oakmont homes, and if you don't have an income over $135,000 a year, it may be possible to get what is in essence a free heat pump. A heat pump is an electric device 
that replaces the gas furnace. And if you lived through last winter, you know what the cost of gas went through. Okay. Then what you want to do is talk to the solar installer. While I understand it can be a little frightening to think of it, okay, the installer can walk you through the economics, taking you through heat pump, car, plug-in, electric, whatever you want, okay, and your regular electric use. And what then the issue of an old roof, they'll look at your roof. It is not extraordinarily expensive to take the solar off, put the roof repair in, and put the solar back on. Okay, so if your 17-year roof still has eight years to go, okay, it doesn't mean that you should wait solar for eight years. And if anybody hasn't noticed that this month, PG&E got another increase in their electric rates, and anybody noticed this little footnote at the bottom of that, which is they've applied for another two increases this year, okay, on top of what we're already paying, okay? So you put in a new solar, you're going to get 15 cents per kilowatt hour, including a battery, by the way, in that, as opposed to 45 cents is where you are right now, which is likely to go to 60 cents. Final point. If you have a medical condition that requires you to have an electronic device, and an example is a CPAP machine, then you qualify for what is called medical baseline treatment by PG&E. If you qualify for medical baseline, you can get, watch my word now, a free solar battery. Did you catch the word? Okay. Free solar battery. Matter of fact, my next door neighbor got two batteries for 25 kilowatts and made money. The rebate she got exceeded the cost of the installation. Okay. So have an installer look at your situation. Don't assume that you're so technically qualified you can tell what the answer is. Okay. But look at it with a heat pump and look at it with a electric vehicle or plug-in. And you absolutely can get a used plug-in that will get you started. Let, let me, uh, yeah, did you, you, you were concerned about getting a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid? Yeah, I, I don't have uh, a lot of data to back up the statement I'm going to make here, but I would be willing to bet that your savings over, you know, using gasoline for the, for the amount that you're going to use to plug in would be probably more than worthwhile, even without solar. So, um, you know, now my wife has an older uh, Prius. It only, uh, I think the range is about 10 miles. I think the new ones are like 30. So the, depending on what vehicle you get and how much driving you do on it, you know, obviously if it's, if it's a lot of driving on the battery, that could throw this off. But um, if you're not buying a brand new car, if you're getting a, a you know, four or five, six year old uh, plug-in hybrid, you might find that it's it's fine the way it is and you don't even have to uh, make the jump to solar right now. Uh, just to go back to this table, which I think is what Tim is talking about. Uh, a gasoline car is gonna cost you about 12 and a half cents per kilowatt hour, 12 and a half cents per mile, I'm sorry. And the plug-in without solar, about four cents. George, what price for gasoline did you use? Six. Six what? Dollars? Six dollars per gallon. Oh, wow. Okay. It says it's off. Let's look it up so it says it's off. Test. Um, we have done what you suggest in terms of putting solar. We have 20 some odd panels on our roof with a heat pump for the heating and air conditioning and a heat pump for the hot water heater and an induction stove and had the gas turned off. 
before a lot of the uh, cold days. A little caveat, though, about following in our footsteps with doing all of that is that we didn't get all the benefit you can from the solar um, because of the lack of sunshine over the past month or two. And so here you're counting on that uh, uh, in the winter. At, uh, you may not see the kind of results that are being discussed here. So I, I think that caveat is really worth it because we got N phase rather than Tesla batteries. And with that, we got a nice uh, uh, software package that allows me to monitor what's happening. And we've come nowhere close to paying anything off. And I'm so glad to see the sun. I'm going to look at what happened for today because <laughs> it, so far it hasn't really been worth it. But this is going to change by next fall. I'm sure. Anybody yeah. who has lived with solar recognizes that uh, January is not the best month to take a look at your economics. It's, but it's, it's, a, it's a year round analysis. It, it's been a rainy winter, unfortunately. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to have to leave, so I'm going to want me to pass the mic to. Okay, I think we're at a stopping point. Joe, Tim, thank uh, you so much. Avatar, if you have any more questions, come grab Joe at the end. And for those online, we're closing up now. Thank you, George. If anybody wants to see this film about the Chinese uh, approach to making electric cars, you'd be shocked. You can just sit down here and watch it. It's just interesting.